focus on your breath and try to figure out the best way to focus on the breath. This is a quality called evaluation. It's pretty simple. You're with the breath. But there are lots of ways of breathing and there are lots of ways of being with the breath. Where you're going to focus in the body, how long the breathing is going to be, how short, heavy, light, shallow, deep, and what image of the breath you're going to hold in mind. There are lots of options, which means there's lots of room to play. But the play here has a serious purpose. We're trying to get the mind as firmly established as possible, with a sense of well-being, a sense of balance. So experiment. And if you're not sure if one breathing method feels better than another, just try it for a while and see what it does to the body, see what it does to the mind. And then change and try that one for a while. You could spend the whole hour doing this. What you're doing is getting more sensitive to what you're doing and the results of what you're doing right here, right now. And also just more sensitive to what it feels like to have a sense of well-being in the body. In the beginning, it's going to be pretty ordinary, sitting here without any pains. Or if there are pains in the body, focus on the parts that are not. But they're going to seem fairly ordinary. But if you give them some space, give them some time, you begin to see that the breath energy going through the body can have an impact, either tensing things up or helping things to relax giving energy or taking energy away. And that sensitivity is what you want to get more and more attuned to, because you're going to use that sensitivity to make judgments in other areas of your life as well. That's what the practice is all about. We hear so much about it. Meditation is learning how to be non-judgmental. I can't find that anywhere in the Buddhist teachings. I mean, evaluation is a kind of judgment, and you want to develop that quality of the mind so it, you can use it skillfully. You can be judicious in your judgments and not judgmental, but also sensitive to what you're doing, because it's what we're doing that ties us down. You know, the Buddha's image is of a fire. The fire clings to its fuel, and it's always trapped by its fuel. When it goes out, that's when it's released from the fuel. It goes out because it lets go. That's how they understood the process of fire in his time. And that's the analogy that applies to the mind. We're holding on to things that are making us suffer. And how do we get release from them? We learn to let go. And we do that by passing judgment on what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. The Buddha illustrates this with the analogy of a bronze cup filled with a liquid, a beverage that looks very nice. And in one case, the beverage is healthy for you, and the other case, the beverage can kill you, or at least cause you a lot of pain. And hungry, thirsty people come along, and they say to each of the people, okay, here's this beverage which is good for you. Near this beverage, which is poisonous. Sometimes they don't give you the choice, it's just the poisonous beverage. And they say, Here, you're thirsty, but here's this poisonous beverage. It's, it's going to taste very nice as you drink it, it's going to look very nice, and it's in a nice bronze cup. But it's going to make you sick, bring about death or death like pain. And as the Buddha said, it's the wise person who will say, No, there are other things I could drink. I'll put up my, with my thirst for the time being. It's the unwise person who'll take the beverage, doesn't care about the consequences because he's so thirsty. And that's the problem with most of us. We're so thirsty for things that we just grab on to anything. We'll do all kinds of things because we think it's worth it, or the payback down the line is something you say, I'll deal with that later, but I want something that I like right now. The ability to say no to things like that 
is your is a measure of your wisdom, a measure of your discernment. And it comes down to seeing what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. Like the fact you're meditating right here, right now. You probably didn't think about meditating as soon as you came out of the, your mother's womb. It's taken time and a lot of experience for you to realize that this is something you'd actually want to do. Sit here in one position for an hour with your eyes closed. I've encountered a lot of people who, even though they've been through a lot in life, would never want to do this. One woman who came here because a friend had brought her. And after an hour of sitting out under the trees, it was a lovely day. I was sitting out at the outdoor classroom. The temperature was just right. It wasn't too hot, too cold, a little bit of a breeze. And after she came out of the meditation, she said, I've never suffered so much in my life. There's someone else, a guy I knew, and a student the college I went to. I was invited back to teach meditation. After 15 minutes, he came out and he was talking about how he was going through sensory deprivation. He was totally disoriented. So a lot of people don't see what we're doing right now here as worth it. As in fact, they see it as something they'd want to stay away from. But we've begun to see the question of whether we're going to be happy in life or suffering in life is going to depend on the quality of our minds and how you develop them. You develop them through mindfulness, alertness, sitting here with the breath. You develop a lot of good qualities this way. This is how your discernment develops. Things that you used to see you were worth doing, the games you used to play as a child, the things you did when you were a teenager. As you grow up and get more mature, you realize they're not worth it. And things that, as a child, as a teenager, might never have appealed to you suddenly make a lot of sense, because you've been observant. Well, that's the principle that carries you all the way through the practice. You learn to be more and more discern discerning about what you're doing, the results, and what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. When the Buddha talks about insight of Vipassana, he doesn't teach a technique. He calls Vipassana is a quality of the mind, clear seeing quality of the mind. And what does it see? Well, it sees things as they arise, what's making them arise, and then when they pass away. And then at the same time, while it's watching things arise, it begins to see what's the allure of these things. Why do you want to go with them? And it sees the drawbacks, and it weighs the two. And then when it sees that the drawbacks out, outweigh the benefits, outweigh the allure, that's when it can get an escape from things. That's, what in, that's how insight works. It is judgmental, or it is judicious. It passes judgment. It's simply a question of how sensitive you are and what options you see. If something is the best possible thing, if you think the poison in the cup is the only thing that you're going to be able to drink, you might go for it. But when you realize that there are other options, better options. then you're going to be less and less likely to go for the things with drawbacks. You want something whose allure doesn't contain any poison. And so as you're sitting here meditating, working on your evaluation, working on figuring for the mind what the mind will go for right now. The Buddha's image is of a cook. who's sensitive to what his master likes. The foolish cook just keeps producing food and doesn't really notice what the master eats, what he likes, what he praises. The intelligent cook listens, notices. Sometimes he doesn't even have to listen, just watch. What does the master reach for? What does he take again and again? Okay, make more of that. The same with your mind. You've got to learn how to observe your mind. What does the mind go for? 
as you try to get it settled down with the breath. What kind of breathing does it like? What kind of breathing does it not like? Where does it like to be focused? Observe these things. And then observe what could be better in terms of getting the mind more solidly settled down. What are the activities I'm doing that don't need to be done? Sometimes we find that we're breathing mechanically simply because we feel the need, somehow that we feel obliged to breathe with a certain amount of strength and a certain amount of energy put into the breath. But what if calmer breathing were better? And how do you calm the breathing down without suppressing it? We well, connect all the breath energies in the body. And when everything's connected, then you're just very still with that, and the need to breathe heavily grows more and more still. At the same time, though, the body is filled with good breath energy. You develop a sense of well-being that's more solid at the same time that requires more care in getting it and maintaining it, but at the same time a lot less energy has to go into it. The payback is a lot bigger. We keep doing that, noticing, 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 observing, experimenting. And that's how your sensitivity develops as to what's worth doing and what's not. And this is one of the big problems in, in life, is that we have a very bad sense of judgment as to what's worth doing and what's, what, what's not. drive up the road to Las Vegas and you see the big signs. They advertise 93% payback rate. And people keep going there, even though they're basically telling them, you give us a dollar, we'll give you 93 cents back. Somehow the thrill is worth it. Thinking, well, maybe someday they give us a more than the dollar. A few people get more than a dollar, most people don't. That's why they say it's 93% payback rate. And there's so many things in life where we dress things up so they seem a lot more attractive than they really are. We fool ourselves, and part of the mind likes to be fooled. But there should be another part of the mind that says, I've had enough. I want something better. And that's the part of the mind you want to listen to. That's the part of the mind that will get you to release. Because that's what release is, the mind letting go through its discernment of what's not worth doing anymore. And you just take that question and you keep pursuing it further and further in. You try to see what's the best thing that the mind can fabricate. There's some very subtle states of concentration, very strong. And as you develop them, you find yourself getting attached to them. But that's okay, because that attachment allows you to let go of attachment, say, to sensuality, and attachment to unskillful thoughts, or even attachment to less subtle and strong states of concentration. We finally get to the point where this is the best that fabrication can offer, and you begin to see that this too has its drawbacks. That's when the mind is really willing to give the unfabricated a try. Up to that point, there's something about lack of fabrication in the mind that scares it. But there comes a point where the mind is no longer scared, and that's when it can let go. But it starts with this ability to evaluate. What are you doing? What are the results? Are the results worth it? What might be better? If you keep those questions in mind, they'll take you all the way.